I, I, you know, I, as usual, make. You have a sign. Yeah, five minutes, one minute. Okay, four V is that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You want me to announce it right away? At the end. Okay. <laughs> Oh. And I've given up trying to be. I know, I don't know if it's cold or hot. I get very hot because I feel like I'm really nervous. And then I kind of flare up. It was great. It's so interesting. Um, and then I'm freezing. What? It's always petty. No, it was perfect. You're signing autographs, are you? Yes. <laughs> We are going to begin this panel. Take your seat, please. Okay, we are going to begin this panel. My name is Mamadou Djouf. My name is Mamadou Djouf, and I teach history at Columbia University. Uh, my two colleagues who are going to be the presenters in this panel have been already uh, uh, discussing about both the content of their presentation and the conversation they are going to engage in. And thanks to that, we have come up with a title for this panel we propose to Saskia, which is The Trade of Ideas and Goods from Artifacts to Citizenship. And what the presentations are, are going really to focus is to explore continuities and discontinuities between colonial and post-colonial cities on one hand, but also between metropoles and imperial cities. And the focus will be objects, and the object they not only circulating, but the narrative attached to such objects and how actually such narrative is be, are being produced, contested by actors. I think that since the beginning of this discussion, 
We talked a lot about space, about infrastructure. This will be really about people, about ways they are imagining the city, way they are representing it, and also the material practices which are associated to such narratives. Narratives and practices which are, in many cases, uh, qualifying the city. And in many cases, it's opposite. And what is the opposite of the city could be an interesting di de discussion. It's also about defining uh, the city, the rules to inhabit it, to make claim in it, and also to accommodate the past an object of the past in an urban environment. So the discussion about the presence and absence will be a discussion about meaning attached to object and the fluidity of people, the circulation of people in the city, but the way in which also the city is imagined and projected in the space. So we'll begin by Yona's first presentation she will be followed by Sudir, by Clementine, and after Clementine, Sudir will actually close the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Saskia and Richard, for including me in this amazing conversation. Um, today, I want to talk about uh, the idea of citizenship in the sense of participation in urban life through the lens of the artifact of architecture and design. I want to suggest that there is actually an exciting process of reinvention of citizenship taking place through the built environment. And I don't mean this in a national, national citizenship, but kind of urban citizenship. To do this, I will discuss two areas. One, a historical example of the work of ordinary citizens. And two, an overview of some contemporary professional designers what interests me is how design lends agency to their action and how each uses design and architecture as a tool to participate in urban life. Uh, from creating a city in the historical example to contemporary interventions, both cases engage with the dynamic of citizenship. So the first one is called Becoming Urban or the Global Street. We're at a point in the history of our planet where one third of human habitation will soon be in informal settlements. If this is the new paradigm of urbanism, we need to understand it better, uh, to realize it's not homogeneous. The informal is not only an economic reality, but a cultural one that has very different expressions in different parts of the world and historical periods. Uh, but we also, I think, need to keep interrogating the dichotomy between formal and informal um, and to see the tensions between the two. Generally, why is informal urbanism successful? Because it's a way for individuals to exert agency over the basic elements of their daily lives and to reconfigure their immediate reality when the state is unable to help. Um, in the case of the currently troubled European metropolis of Athens that I will briefly show, although um, not a shanty town, there is a great deal of informality here. The majority of the post-war city, usually regarded by tourists and locals um, as terribly ugly, abject, <clears throat> was built by a multitude of small builders and developers via the facilitation of a special financial arrangement that favored small-scale development without the help of mortgages and banks, which at the time produced the so-called economic miracle of post-war middle-class prosperity. Via great ingenuity and economy of means, a particular building type that existed more or less before the war, a version of simplified modern architecture, the five to six story apartment block, generically called the polykatikia, was endlessly multiplied and created the modern city, enabling the rural migrants who poured into Athens in the early post-war decades to become urban citizens. In my analysis, this particular urban form and the cat and mouse game with the authorities became an instrument through which ordinary people aspiring to achieve 
modern life, took agency. The lack of innovation in a formal sense meant that the building type and the city generated was, and still is, unloved and resisted by architects and other inte intellectuals. However, I want to argue that on a level of design, it was not without intelligence. I have identified certain characteristics that I think are particular to the specific context and historical, political, and economic time, which I call tactics, processes, procedures of creativity. They include the idea of metis, um, our ruse, resourcefulness, economy of means, simplification, addition, repetition, accumulation. Most of all, I found a performative element that has to do with how knowledge is transferred in non-literate groups, which is through memorization, repetition of certain themes with few changes each time that results in a kind of improvisation where certain themes stay the same and others are improvised and negotiated each time. The processes I identified could equally be called a form of civics, invented or developed at a moment of rapid social change, where the built environment helped to absorb these changes, as well as the political instability that followed the war and civil war. You could not get a government job if you had a record of belonging to the left, but you could be a builder, and no one cared about your political affiliations. Most of all, this was instrumental in the transformation of rural migrants to citizens. And in this sense, it was successful, despite being architecturally uninteresting. Second part, design, uh, current design, or design and citizenship today. Um, what could this uh, civics mean for architecture today? Um, well, I want to claim that, I mean, I see interesting overlaps between the historical example of the informal city that I showed you and the work of certain architects today. Um, and I want to suggest that uh, current design practices are coming up with new tactics for the challenges we're faced with that embrace low-tech innovation, resilience, adaptability, all qualities that were there also in the post-war example of Athens. These new practices are trying to act as advocates and activists to mobilize those same kinds of energies, um, but want to understand and support this kind of cat and mouse game with the authorities. I think we saw that a little bit with the work of Teddy Cruz, um, in a good sense, in order to improve the lives of citizens. Um, and this becomes a new form of civic activism. Um, and I'm going to show you some examples. Um, this is also a larger question, I would say, of the arts in general at the moment. And um, art historian and uh, curator Okwin Weiser at the Ecogram conference here a couple of years ago talked about, and he said, uh, talked about how certain artistic groups are exploring the potential of emancipatory civic techniques, taking to task strategies of activism and oppositionality to create a possibility of civic production that he calls civic imagination. Um, our moderator, Professor Mamadou Diouf, um, talks about the arts of citizenship, which I think he means the association of arts and contestation in the process of recapturing and reframing public space in many African cities. I am interested in how these artistic practices take a particular form in design and architecture. Uh, and I see two ways that this is happening. One, architects and designers are taking the initiative to respond to crisis both in the developed and the developing world, by advocating for and creating innovative low-cost buildings such as the work of the Rural Studio in Alabama, public architecture in San Francisco, mass design group with the hospital in Rwanda, architecture for humanity, some of the architects we've had here at the Ecogram conferences such as Francis Quere, who build schools in Burkina Faso um, and find the funding and work on the whole um, process of um, making these buildings. Um, secondly, and perhaps less well known, are architects helping with coordination and designing processes, not necessarily objects. I want to focus today on this more performative element, um, 
a kind of low-tech, do-it-yourself urbanism via action uh, and intelligent use of materials and techniques um, that I see as mobilizing, again, the same kind of energies as I found in the post-war Athens, but in a self-conscious way, adding design expertise. And I'm going to show you briefly some examples of how I think this is currently uh, played out. Uh, the first is uh, called Superuse. It's a Dutch design group, uh, 2012 architects. In a way, it reminds me of Saskia's notion of recoding and hacking. Instead of recycling, they, they take um, discarded materials, also rubble from construction, and use them in new ways, combine them in new ways to produce something completely different. Um, this one is uh, their office, out of Miele washing machines, discarded washing machines. This is a, a theater, a stage out of discarded sinks. This one is um, it's not by them, but it's in a website that they've created. This is a Hummer turned into an eco, um, you know, uh, pavilion. <laughs> um, and this is the site that they've created where hundreds of people, you know, hundreds of projects from around the world are collected in the site that are also doing this kind of super use concept. The second is this person, um, this architect in Seville, uh, Santiago Sirugueda, with his concept of urban recipes, um, which are semi-legal strategies for housing and urban renovation uh, that he proposes. Um, uh, he's, um, he, he tries to inhabit the gaps between laws, exploiting overlap and oversight, to practice what he calls autonomous architecture. I don't have time to go through these, but I think you can see. And also producing these manuals, which he posts on his website for everybody to use. Um, he also works with utilizing empty urban lots for temporary uses, from playgrounds to uh, dwellings. Another uh, tactic that I see taking place, negotiation of existing unfinished, unused spaces, such as the work of this group, or this group. Uh, these, th they are from France. Um, uh, this, uh, here you have an urban, in a way, uh, eco box, urban farming, as Saskia has been talking about, from discarded materials. And then this uh, person, here, who calls himself a hacktivist, who is from Strasbourg, Florian Riviere, inspired by hacker culture. Here uh, you have the, the, the parking garage that was mentioned this morning, completely transformed. Uh, and various other actions in the city. And then this is Droog Design Group, a very, very um, interesting group in, in um, Amsterdam. This is their boom bench and moving forest. <laughs> and finally, just uh, there's quite a lot of examples of parks and parklets, and that was also mentioned this morning by Stephen, among others. Um, the most successful of which are, I, in my opinion, um, uh, well, there are different examples. This is from Milan. It's a, an artist and designer. This is from San Francisco, the Rebar Group, which is a group of architects and other artists, but primarily architects. This they call sidewalk uh, bump out, where they, they proposed it, they worked with the authorities, and they got it built. And then finally, parking. Um, the transformation of a parking space by feeding the meter and asking the question, what is the range of possible occupancy for this short-term lease? And this, again, <laughs> is uh, a site that you can find examples, hundreds of examples from around the world posted. Uh, and I just picked a few. So to end, whereas in Athens, um, I think, you know, utilizing particular performative roles, certain specific building processes and a building type were collectively created or invented that were rich enough and flexible enough to enable the transition from rural to urban. I want to suggest that today, professional designers and architects and historians and critics who see themselves taking an activist role want to, and want to engage with the dynamic of citizenship are learning from informal practices. They are inventing new concepts, organizing principles, and also inviting others to participate. 
they are looking at the informal as a cultural phenomenon, um, and in addition, they utilize their technical expertise, and because of the state of global connectivity, it is now possible to make these ideas public very, very quickly, and they can therefore play a key role in achieving social goals. This new work, uh, in my opinion, is refreshingly hopeful and different, offering offbeat solutions that are imaginative, spectacular, and vigorous, with a vigorous sense of civic movement, advancing a concept of social sustainability through design. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Don Bagnato. Thank you, Saskia. Thank you, Richard, for inviting me to come and talk here. I hope it won't be too incongruous. I hope not. Um, but maybe I should explain the way the slides will work when they appear. It's a loop. Um, they're 15 seconds a piece. And I'm going to allow you to work out how they relate to what I'm going to talk about. I guess this one's blank, and it's 15 seconds long. Never mind. Um, one of the questions in Teatro Mundi is the question of the cultural center. One of the questions that Saskia has brought to, to our attention is the movement may be below the radar from what you have called dense working class neighborhoods and their practices, which are often aesthetic um, and loaded in that sense, and how they, they actually move into the, the cultural centers. I um, have taken over an ethnographic museum in Frankfurt. Now, Frankfurt is a city of trade. And when you try and investigate what ethnographic city, uh, museums mean in Germany, you find very quickly that, actually, this isn't 15 seconds at all. This is very fast. So I hope it won't drive you mad. Just let me know. When you talk about um, former ethnographic museums or even ethnographic museums today in Germany, you realize very quickly that the question of colonialism is barely touched upon. What really has happened in the case of Frankfurt in particular, or Hamburg as another good case in point, is that trade has been part of the, the constitution of these museums, which in terms of German imperialism appear, appeared quite late but were very active in their collecting. So, you know, Frankfurt, for example, as a freie, freie, freie Stadt, Freie Burg, has been um, at the center of international trade for over 900 years. Fairs existed, functioned way before the banks. In the 16th century, Germany set up trading posts or colonies in Venezuela, Ghana, or the Amazon region. And it was only in the 19th century, as I just mentioned, that um, uh, mercantile incentives really started to merge with scholarly research. And so often when I'm looking at this museum, I'm thinking to myself, is the museological assemblage of ethnographic objects ultimately a side product of commercial trade? And, you know, if you look at ethnographic museums, a case in point is the Torpen Museum in Amsterdam, you see the display of emporia. You see the 19th century department store aesthetic coming back. Now, founded in 1904, the Weltkulturen Museum in Frankfurt houses today 67,000 objects, 120,000 images and films, and 50,000 books. It doesn't need to go anywhere else. It has everything in its stores. Um, that's one of the plus points of the economic crisis, that is that you work with what you have at home, so to speak. In 1904, Bernard Hagen, um, in his inaugural speech um, to open the Weltkulturen Museum, said, and I'm quoting him here, remember that this is over 100 years old, he said, our German fatherland has evolved from a major power into a world power, and German trade and commerce now has a large, indeed massive interest in all five continents. What did China, let alone Japan, mean to a German merchant only 50 years ago, i.e. mid-19th century? Today, every large manufacturer or merchant must bear these empires in mind, not to mention the Australian and African markets. A slight upset in a remote corner of East Asia may trigger the most severe stock market crisis here. Now, this is a gap not filled by the geography of trade. This is where the new science of ethnography comes into play. 
So I'm faced with a legacy at the Weltkulturen Museum in 2012, which involves three options. Either I repatriate and I engage in a kind of relic diplomacy, which is not always very practical in the long run because within a week certain Congolese pieces might be back on the market in Brussels, or I continue the imprisonment, the kind of conservation ideology that is kind of clearly part of these museums, which means that the objects are incarcerated, they're in prisons, so to object prisons, or I try and remediate them. And I ask myself, how can former ethnographic objects that offered a scholarly parallel to imperial trade become relevant today as reflectors of new routes of exchange and new patterns of citizenship? How does a museum of ethnography create presence for people today who have no national, colonial, or historical connection to those cultures that are represented in its collections? In other words, when a young woman of very mixed background comes into the museum uh, and looks at a piece that was produced by Francis Nagenda in Kampala in the early 80s, and I ask her, where, you know, how, you, what do you know about Uganda, Kampala, and she'll say, no, I know nothing about Kampala, but I know a lot about South Baghdad. So then I have a problem not only with an issue of anachronism, but I have a, di a geopolitical displacement that really affects the way I can try and bring these objects back into the consciousness of the people who live in Frankfurt today. Are we able to transform old worlds into new politically, social, sentient configurations? Is this about a culture clash of ethnicities or the challenge of some kind of intermediate adaptation, soldering perceptions through new educational alloys, bringing anachronistic objects onto a new dialogical middle ground that has to battle against the tropes of ethnographic narrative, disciplinary orthodoxy, and the ideology of explanation in the sense of Ranciere. In short, the continuing, today, continuing desire to preserve the logos of ethnos. So there is, in talking about the global street today and in presenting you um, with this very speedy PowerPoint and the ideas that I'm going to talk about, a kind of congruity and horror at the fact that we're looking again at the global street. We're looking at those areas which were the subject matter of anthropologists in the last you know, 200 years, to say the least. And it's, it's something which I'm not quite sure how to deal with, the street, the Volk, die Völker, and their objects. In 2011, in order to accompany the shift into what could be called a post-ethnographic context, the Weltkultur Museum in Frankfurt created a laboratory. It brought back the laboratory that had become doomed since Levi Strauss's major talk at UNESCO in 1953, where he said, you can't work with these objects anymore. You have to study behavior and voice and language and cognition. Um, we wanted to go full circle and take field work back to the museum. Now, what's important, and this is a key issue here in this paper, is that it's domestic in scale. You saw the villa earlier. It's an old villa where people lived. We have three of those. And so we believe that in this workshop laboratory, we can generate a new contextualization, not only of our own research, but also try and enhance shared histories and cultural exchange. This happens through analyses and experiments that place and this is crucial, place the artifacts from the collection at the center of all inquiry. In other words, what we do is we work with the things. And in order to work with these objects, we had to create spaces where we could look at them. Because in the, in the, the areas, in the stores, no, in quotes, miscegenation is possible between regions, between ethnic groups, between um, objects at all. Um, guest artists, designers, writers, photographers, filmmakers, researchers live for several weeks at a time, work on site, and have the opportunity to develop their own unique take on the collection and create test works based on historical artifacts. So the museum's trade in perceptions operates through production. The practical application of concepts and the creation of new material objects aims to go effectively beyond the academic appraisal of past history in a, and, and view the objects in its collection as prototypes, as unfinished business. 
developing situations that interpolate today's communities without obfuscating the past, which is crucial. If this dialogical approach is successful, then the original collection is expanded through new test works designed in the museum and in a variety of media. Now, if one accepts that underpinning all collections are traces of former trade routes, and if one takes the metaphor of tracking one step further, then it is curious to consider how certain collections from the past today represent either a continuing flow or an impasse. For think about those areas in so-called encyclopedic or, or universal museums that are cul-de-sacs. Think of a museum like, like a street or rather like a motorway. Yeah, a major museum of contemporary art is for me an autobahn. It's a motorway. And you can take a scenic route and um, start working in a dormant museum. But think of the collections that we can't update or rather don't update. Are those precisely the artifacts whose public exchange value or visibility in a cultural arena or whose presence in gendering capacity is consciously repressed? And an obvious example is an armory of the 18th and 19th century Universal Museum. Where does this get updated to include the kind of warfare technology and weaponry or food security strategies and measures that we hear about through the media that is purchased through middlemen both illegal and governmental, and that constitutes a trade which has neither discussed nor exhibited, like it had been in the last 200 years, for the cultural edification of the public. Similarly, collections that reflect highly nationalist identifications, such as those found in folklore or Volkskunde museums in Germany, no longer seem to function, obviously, in the same way today. Their purpose as reflectors of citizenships, of citizenships is redundant. The trait roots that underpin their reasoning have shifted and the middleman man role of the museum operates within a different dynamic. Now let's assume, following a conversation with Richard Sennett in London quite recently, that a person who moves from one part of the world to another, a so-called migrant, brings with him or her a set of objects in their suitcase. The transition to a new environment alters and shifts the architectural frame within which these objects once found their place. Their owner has to renegotiate the presence of these things within his new experience or her new experience and its spatial context. This could be an apartment, but it doesn't really matter. This is an activity of adaptation and adjustment which helps to re-signify meanings and affect between objects and places. Now, an ethnographic museum, and this, by the way, is um, the booty of a collection from the CPIC taken in 1961. Um, an ethnographic museum introduces a further dimension of agency. It's the anthropologist or the collector. Because between the movement from the CPIC to here, the city of Frankfurt, from, say, the, the ownership of the object has altered what of from one of straightforward personal possession, as we had just earlier, to one of ambivalent custodianship. The object is no longer housed in the home, the market stall, or placed on the ritual altar relative to its origin, nor taken in a suitcase as a personal souvenir, but passes through a process of reconstruction that involves conservation, internment, administration, assessment, seriality, anonymity, etc. The ethnographer as collector is now in the middleman position and turns out to be the person who either generates a story or a history around an object or chooses not to, denies presence or seeks to enhance its potential. And it's very curious that we've had Hamish Clayton, a New Zealand writer in residence for the last month, and his work is all about the ethics of storytelling in the context of the museum. In short, there are cultural centers, cultural institutions, which act as trading posts, and there are the middlemen or brokers who negotiate exchanges of knowledge between groups and individuals. The rules of the game may vary. The scale of trade and exchange will reflect different economic, political um, incentives of state, national, municipal, or private ownership and custodianship. 
Visibility is not always guaranteed. The middleman may be illegal, or the institution may wish to obfuscate their engagement. So ownership, as Stephen Duncan said, is ambiguous, and it's ambiguous in a center like an ethnographic museum. So to conclude, I'd like to make a proposal, which brings us back a little bit to the architectural. And I think that it's the museum building that has the potential to provide the space for these objects to make presence once again. And by this, I'm not doing a kind of like, oh, you, as people say, the politicians in Frankfurt say to me, how are you going to get the people who live near the train station into the gentrified area in Shaoman Kai on the riverside where the museums are? It's not about that. It's much more, um, uh, what's the word? It's more internal, practically. Um, it's not about a corporate, large-scale approach to a cultural center or museum, but one in which, however large, the, however expansive, even if we do ever get a new building, that doesn't really matter. What counts is that the museum becomes both conceptually and physically more domestic, more in-house, a temporary home, a sheltered space, a maison de passe, a halfway house, a loose cube, which can be usurped for an informal education without entry or exit examinations. And by this, I'm making a very clear point in contradistinction to university exit and entry examinations. So I see the museum as a location for a kind of anti-education. But how can this be achieved without the class-based paternalism of European attitudes of compensation and integration? That is the problem we find with so-called world culture museums. Which, are, which were defined by UNESCO in the year 2000. Here we have practically no objects. Go to Gothenburg, go to other museums that have become part of this transformation into world cultures. You have a lot of staging in instead. You're, the museum is now ashamed of its collection. The collection no longer represents the people who should be welcomed into this new agora as if, oddly enough, they were closer to the core, closer to those indigenous European tribes who built these cultural and educational institutions in the first place. These imagined communities are catered for, catered as in consumption. In other words, why one goes there, how much one pays, what one acquires. And again, you find purchase, legacy, exchange, and looting underlie these ethnographic institutions. If we take on the possibility that individuals and groups from, I quote Saskia, dense working class neighborhoods can and wish to, I quote again, make presence in the cultural centers of the city, then the position of the middleman raises interesting questions. There is no legitimate trader of perceptions. There is a hawker, a hacker, or a middleman whose method may well be chaotic, informal, part of a non-accountable method of administrative activity and most probably linked, and this we've said earlier, to a whole number of tricky, un indiscernible, but active aesthetic practices. The middleman may need to be rethought within cultural centers, quite obviously as the artist, the architect, the designer, the visitor, the collection, a house, in other words, that can engender intermediation, or as Philippe Descola would claim, Le musée est un grand trafiquant d'agence, a kind of forex bureau of agency. For historical collections have an anthropomorphic, even fetishist feel to them. They evoke relations between people, things, and ideas, between failures and successes, between the inheritance of meaning and their erasure over time. The ethnographic museum represents a survival of a particularly obsessive form of cultural and scientific institution, one that is simultaneously local and diasporic, possessive and rehabilitating, familiar and feral. To attempt to remediate its collections today is to engage with discomfort, doubt, and melancholia, but also to activate a necessary process of revitalization, a production site in the urban context. Thank you.
Good afternoon. I hope we'll have a chance to talk about this middleman concept. I think the idea of brokerage, particularly when we're thinking about the street, is very, I think it's a very useful one as a way to move forward this, this dialogue. I, I'm grateful to be able to follow up on these two sessions. Am I talking too loudly? Can you hear me now? Um, I was saying that I hope we'll have a chance to talk about this middleman or brokerage concept because I think it's a particularly useful social position to interrogate as we think about the street and the ways in which we encounter whatever the street means. Um, when I first got, was asked to, to uh, come here, with great appreciation to, to Saskia and Richard, um, I, I thought I would speak about what I've been doing for 18 years or so, which is uh, work with uh, young, young people on the street, as it were. Um, and instead, I think I'm going to talk about the last three years of my life, which is that I've been an employee at the FBI, and I've just returned to Columbia, and it's a, it's a joy to be back here. So I'm going to read a, a paper that I've been working on uh, in that vein. Think of the last time that you saw a police officer being publicly reprimanded by a superior. It's a rare sighting for bird watchers and crime watchers alike. I last saw this occur in 2010 in a quaint courthouse in Charlotte, North Carolina. A 20-something crime fighter, white and southern, sporting an oversized four-button suit and a few fresh whiskers, stood up in the middle of the cavernous, cavernous courthouse lobby to receive his boss's censure, which was now echoing for all to hear. He was a small southern cop in a land of parochial towns, but he was now working part-time for the FBI, and his life was anything but pastoral. You work for them, but you belong to me, do you understand? His local police commander was sternly instructing him, alternatively using his finger to point at my direction and to repeatedly stab the young man's crumpled white shirt. If you see something, he continued, you come to me first, not them. You need to learn that. You got it? With each poke of his superior's finger, the young man's head reared back about five inches, and he looked to see if we were noticing, and it was hard not to. I was standing about 20 feet away alongside two local FBI agents and two local, two federal two FBI agents, excuse me, and two federal prosecutors. The police commander wasn't entirely enthusiastic that one of his officers was now on the federal payroll. As the young man would later say to me, that's not the way we traditionally do things down here. I was the odd man out, a sociologist who joined the FBI to document the impact and effectiveness of their crime fighting strategies. I was sent by the director's office to local FBI bureaus around the country. This was the morning of my first visit to North Carolina's regional field office. This was also my first data point on a study of the new structure of American law enforcement where the feds and locals were collaborating. So far, I was not seeing a harmonious relationship brewing. Sometimes these local chiefs, well, they get a little sensitive when their guys work for us, my host, an FBI agent, whispered to me. By their guys, he meant local cops, town cops. Us guys were the feds. The agent and the FBI in general were trying to get more of their guys to become us guys, making town cops into G-men. Welcome to American policing, 21st century. To be specific, the two men were working together in what was now called joint task forces, an emergent form of US state policing that links the federal and the local government. For the last 200 years, if there were, was ever a truism in American democracy, it was that locals don't like the feds coming around. They don't want cooperation. The essence of modern Jeffersonian democracy is to emphasize the strength of local governance in matters of security. True deliberative democracy on the ground means keeping the federal presence at bay. And yet, with the joint task forces, this core principle, call it states' rights, call it local autonomy, call it we don't want you coming around here, was being challenged in this little town in rural North Carolina. And for that matter, it was being challenged all over the country. In fact, what was once called, bless you, community policing, the spirited post-war initiative in, pe in which people solve local problems together and with the spirit of cooperation was now being torn asunder as federal agents in Washington profoundly determined local quality of life. I was here because this was a direct transport of ideas that had supposedly shown its effectiveness in European settings where the strength of a federal enforcement agency had been the norm in many countries for decades, if not longer. The FBI director, the learned Robert Mueller, had asked me to join the bureau, and one of the questions I immediately saw in front of me and in front of them was, is European-style enforcement the key to American security? 
This young Southern cop who was being reprimanded was part of the so-called Safe Streets Task Force, lodged in the FBI field offices around the country. Again, taking ideas that were now racing around the globe, the task force operated as a nimble cellular structure in which federal agents mobilized whomever they needed, deputized them, and attacked a local crime problem. They could deputize sheriffs, city beat cops, county police, it didn't matter. What was once local and usually done behind the scenes, off the books, was now full view, in full view of Washington, D.C. You might recognize this word, cellular. It was international terrorism tr terrorism's trope of hooded thugs roaming the Orient in the dark of night that was now motivating U.S. domestic policy. Orientalism with a little baseball and apple pie thrown in. I had just witnessed the outcome of this particular task force, a takedown of a t dangerous 12-person organized crime ring. Success, you would think. The young man and his fellow officers who worked the streets of rural North Carolina were instrumental in providing necessary intelligence to the uh, federal agents. Without them, the federal agents could not operate locally. As one said to me, without these local cops, we couldn't tell Bubba from Bobby. The feds were too conspicuous in a small town of several thousand people. So why then was the young officer suffering a public, re public rebuke by his own police commander? It would seem that taking down drug pins was something to be celebrated, something that the local police chief could be proud of, something that might even cause him to promote the young officer, not something that should earn a scolding. And yet, at a simple level, the local commander wanted to keep that kingpin on the streets. Yes, the criminal that was the head of a large credit card fraud ring, the criminal that was part of a drug running enterprise for Mexican prisons, but to that small town commander, this criminal was actually more useful on the streets, not in jail. And although the feds needed a victory and that meant taking down this kingpin, the locals worried that the jail of this kingpin would give them an even more powerful criminal, one that was unfamiliar to them. For the local police, there is another truism that operates, whether in the suburbs of Paris during the riots, which I'll talk about in a second, or on American streets, and that is, quote, the devil you know is always better no matter how dangerous and deadly he or she is. As any local cop will tell you, sending your highest ranking thug to prison is like letting the criminals grab hold of your gun. But what happens when federal agents and prosecutors want high profile arrests for racketeering and other federal crimes that you hear about in the news? When the local police commander or local organization accepts federal largesse, whether this is an imam in the, in the, in the Paris banlieues or in the U.S., he may also have to accept federal prerogatives. In the U.S., the commander may have to watch as a conviction and dismantlement hurts her ability to maintain good relations on the street. In France, the imam may watch as youth anger is inflamed by a centralized tactical unit who fails to understand that the youth want, above all, to be heard. But in this brave new world where international ideas of security are circulating, namely federal strength, local obedience, and international terrorism as the guide for all policing, well, in this world, the devil you know better is idea is not only quaint, but the state believes it is, to be, it is dangerous for dealing with the new brand of thug, himself nimble, technologically adept in many places at once, cellular, not spatially fixed. So whether in Paris or Peoria, the feds ride into town and take over, and that's what they were doing in North Carolina that day. The import of European and international ideas was not just in the realignment of the state. Indeed, the entire nature of metropolitan America was starting to look more, quote, European, as the think tanks would say. In the U.S., the demographics of vulnerability have meant that the inner city was no longer the fastest rising poverty area. Indeed, after the mid-1990s, the disenfranchised have moved to the edges of the city, to the suburbs, to exurbs, and to small towns. The voices of the dislocated mirrored many cities in a, across Europe where those at the center stave off the marauders from the periphery who come in at night to buy McDo's and Reeboks. These changing circumstances were producing a new band of, brand of, quote, criminal, or a new brand of criminality, one in virtual space as well as in multiple geographies at once. And so the U.S. state, well, it had to act. The question for it was very simple. If the 20th century U.S. model of policing, community policing, was no longer effective, then maybe centralized governance was necessary. Maybe Jeffersonian federalism needed to be rethought with ideas that lay across the pond. When I joined the FBI, I saw a daily drama that has received little attention by scholars, advocates, policy makers. As federal enforcement and local cops, federal agents and local cops increase their collaborations, we may be seeing the end of policing as community policing as we know it. Across the country, the town cop who walks a beat and relies on trust with locals may be a thing of the past. In the U.S., your neighborhood police investigation may now actually be a federal initiative. 
what is emerging maybe the biggest challenge to liberal democratic theory and liberal autonomy and local autonomy that we've seen in some time in this country. Today, with the task force structure, federal local collaborations are targeting a wide range of crimes, and that may be the problem. These collaborations can take several hundreds of thousands of dollars for just the arrests of a few individuals. As I said, these task force style partnerships are only necessarily only American are not necessarily only American in origin, though they are profoundly American in consequence. I argue that they come from the circulation of ideas across the globe regarding effective state practice for enforcement of local security needs. They are either an adaptation or perhaps a mutation of the prominent modality of social regulation that has its roots in dominant approaches to fighting terrorism. Yes, some of these ideas are the result of neocons or the Pentagon and other American institu institutions, but we can't ignore how wider notions of security have taken root here. For example, as I noted earlier, the presence of centralized law enforcement is far more common in Europe, where local policing actually became prominent only in the last 30 years. In the US, the task force structure has two attributes that align with what one sees in Europe. First, that the state of so-called alert, quote unquote, becomes the new normal. Threat becomes normalized, but not necessarily banal. Rather, it is recurrent, intensive, and we are reminded just enough so we don't tune out the fact that our threat levels are always at orange. Threat in the body of the immigrant, the dispossessed, the religious non-adherent. We are reminded by the state's insistent framing that it must come to our assistant when, insistence when other institutions have failed to deal with these, quote, outsiders. It must mop, out, mop up the excess, whether that is the 47% of deadbeats Governor Romney despises or the 99% that occupy Wall Street. Statecraft as compensatory means that policing is no longer viewed as prophylactic or protective, but as push-button policy, ever ready and everywhere applicable, whether for a drug gang, a young Moroccan woman wearing a veil, or an international terrorist plotting to destroy a bridge. Setting the conditions at this level enables the state to frame their actions as urgent, necessary, and without peer, even when the conditions that it is responding to are not. As Neil Walker writes in an essay on European policing, arguments in Europe in favor of international policing are persuasively couched in functionalist terms, even when such arguments are not specifically tied to the policy framework of the EU. The police, the police tend to exercise a stand-in authority within all politics, plugging the gap where the normal authoritative solution or practice has failed, unquote. Well, what does it mean that the law enforcement apparatus takes over the functions once main by, maintained by other civic and governmental institutions? Well, for one, as Stuart Hall reminds us, these are moments in which the state shapes our popular discourse on the expectations of citizenship. You can hear it in the media and in think tank speak, the kind of ever-ready alert that I've been talking about that is premised on the reframing of a population in strict dichotomous terms, law-abiding and transgressive. In late capitalism, these outsiders can no longer be integrated. We no longer need their excess labor to be enacted. Rather, we simply require that it is warehoused. What is often less visible is the process that the state, in, by which the state upends the informal, quotidian means of social regulation that inhabit local communities, how they solve conflicts, how they socialize their young, etc. Indeed, law enforcement sees in these kinds of practices not the signs of cultural diversity, but rather the dangerous signals of non-participation and margin alia above all else. Consider France, where in the wake of the 2005 riots, one saw the alarming impotence of the federal police in their response to the unrest, federal police that had little connection to local youth. In that year, I interviewed some of the rebellious French youth who hit the streets, and they told me matter-of-factly that they didn't think twice when crossing police barricades, but fearing the following day scolding in front of their parents, they wouldn't dare enter the neighboring district of a powerful local religious leader. The broad point is that when the state both recedes and advances in this way, relying on federal-style law enforcement to stabilize situations in the absence of functional social institutions that affect social integration, the risk for further violence grows. Whether the treatment of all public safety problems by a centralized federal action will work remains to be seen. As towns and countries in the U.S. struggle to fund services, the federal resources are hard to turn down. And neither liberals nor conservatives have adequately taken notice of this rewriting of American federalism. There's little theorization of what it means to establish a social contract when law enforcement is no longer a civic practice seen, heard, and felt as a daily presence, but they may soon need to. Support for task force policing is only growing in Washington, and city after city in the U.S. is laying off police and in relying instead on the federal presence to come in at the last moment and restore public safety. 
The stakes will not be just philosophical or doctrinal. As Europe has discovered, with immigration rising, there is little effort to systematically ensure that such newcomers have productive contact with law enforcement institutions. This basic aspect of democratic civics, that police are a necessity, not an annoyance, seems to have escaped the discourse on social integration. As a consequence, we should not be surprised that there are vacuums created at the local level, that the basic task of enforcement and social, social regulation are filled in ways that appear to the natives as strange and uncomfortable, or God forbid, ethnic, traditional, religious. Think of the discussions around the wearing of the veil in France. This is the tip of the iceberg of a broader gap that exists, in part because of the systems of regulation that shape social behavior are multiple, and they don't resonate with one another. The immigrant wears the veil at home, and in turn, their community is turned into a space of cultural singularity, and as a result, can easily be viewed as transgressive and then subject to the need for policing. So to the rise of citizen patrols, you might have heard of these in Switzerland and Italy, among other places, where individuals decide that they will go after the criminals themselves, apprehending and punishing as they see fit, whether the police show up or not. These twin movements are two sides of the same coin. Withdrawal of immigrants into their own separate worlds where systems of indigenous law operate, and on the other hand, a revanchist political movement that is essentially a nationalist strategy to work outside the state to eradicate crime. Of course, this is nothing new. One only has to think of Paris in the years after the Great War. The U.S. is not far behind. The left has completely abdicated the opportunity, and here I'll conclude, the left has completely abdicated the opportunity to address these issues productively, whether in academia, philanthropy, or in civil society, voices rarely do more than critique the security platforms of the state. There's little effort to help shape them in ways that are responsive to the changing democratic landscape, demographic landscape, excuse me. Philanthropic investment in criminal justice reform, for example, is only 1% of total funding in the U.S. Somehow, foundations still don't think of law enforcement as an immigration issue, an education issue as a basic human right. With unemployment rising and waves of immigration no longer coming to the U.S. from white Europe, the U.S. faces similar conundrums. And when we do not take seriously that law enforcement is a critical space to engage the very real questions of what makes good, decent, healthy civic life, we will leave open others to use this lever to push less welcoming agendas. If you're wondering how these vacuums get filled, look no further than Sanford, Florida, in the case of Trayvon Martin. A gun-toting, self-appointed neighborhood watchman shoots and kills a young African-American youth he suspects of involvement in a crime. Police did not come immediately, and in fact, the state's laws permit citizens to police and shoot in self-defense, quote unquote. Welcome to the new era of, Mer of American policing. Americans gleefully celebrate this Wild West style of law enforcement. And when it comes to the guardian angels or citizen patrols and volunteer block clubs, our tradition of self-reliance deserves recognition. But one man's citizen's army is another's vigilante force taking the law into their own hands. And we may unfortunately see more of these instances if we're not careful. As these ideas circulate, our silence could be as equally deadly. Thank you. I would like to thank my colleagues for a very engaging presentation. And the free presentation dealt with really the issue of what is being traded across time and spaces, and which actors, operations, and resources are involved. And if you look at the city as it was explored by Yona through the built environment, which focus is, is the city has a studio, the mm -hmm. art of citizenship, to Clementine's discussion about the museum as a site of configuring a presence through both aesthetic practices, but also looking at migrants and uh, uh, their ways of actually adjusting or being displaced, we see quite clearly how it's also connected with Sudhir uh, was dealing with, which is the FBI has a, has a stage of performance in which, you know, a tradition has been kept, which is the tradition of policing. I think one of, one idea which has played a powerful role, uh, you know, within empire is actually the 
idea of learning ways of, of policing not only colonial subject, but how volescence in policing colonial subject were used actually in metropoles and affected the, the, the technology of policing, which is, I think, important in our discussion about the state and the role of the state in different settings. You know, where the state is reinforcing through technology, where the state is retreating, and how the spaces abandoned by the state are being filled by actually uh, citizens or the population. And one thing interesting which link this presentation with the morning presentation, and in particular the presentation about uh, Occupy Wall Street, uh, is actually the difference of interpretation of, 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 of manifestations in a, in, a, in a Western metropole compared to, an, uh, let's say, an African city, colonial or post-colonial. You know, the importance of the olfactive uh, has a way of subverting the colonial city. You know, the presence of food has a way of signing the presence of the excluded, because structurally, actually, Africans are excluded from cities. But also, uh, you know, I think it's Stefan who was saying he doesn't like drumming. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the most interesting things is that in the late 50s, one of the most popular francophone novelists wrote a novel which was called Clembier. And, and it's about two things. How European, in this case, the French have been so busy in making the cities, the, Afri the, the cities into African cities. No, into Western cities when Africans tr were trying to make the cities Africa. And for him, the most powerful instruments in turning them into African cities is the drumming. Drumming is the way in which African took over European cities and made them Africans. And, and I think it's something which is quite important in understanding the role of, of middlemen and understanding the role of object, which Clementine was discussing, which is quite fascinating also. As long as the object is actually collected by the middleman. The object could be domesticated. Mm -hmm. But when the migrant comes with his or her own object, the mosque is part of it, or the veil. Something new is created. And I think it could be interesting to look at how objects are completely transforming ways in which uh, you know, populations are engaging each mm -hmm. other in a, in a given setting. So, so, so I think these are, these are very important aspects. And for cities, the key aspect, which is the aspect of policing, mm -hmm. has actually affected all the activities and, 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 and practices you know, in the city. And in particular, the understanding of the street. Is it only for passage, or is it possible actually to inhabit it, to live in it? What does it mean to stand in a corner? What does it mean to sit? I think becomes something important because it's redefining in particular from the colonial to the post-colonial how the city is habit. The colonial city is heavily policed. The post-colonial city is a space where people, objects, garbage are piling up and creating a completely new situation and a new understanding of the city. Mm -hmm. So I would like now to open the floor for question, discussion, and comments. OK, go ahead.
I apologize. <laughs> Um, we have a local position here where we have a descendant of Eastern Europe as a mayor, and he's very forcefully uh, uh, inflicting upon my community. I'm from Harlem and Latin kids, uh, stopping and frisking in the city, uh, in the street. And I think it's very, I must commend Sassia for dealing with this street position because as I listened to you, I thought to myself, and I'm an ex headmaster, I thought, and I had been thinking about what is happening to my youth as they're being stopped in the street continually, and, and, I'm, and my young women. And, uh, and so I would like you to comment on that, how you see stop and frisk in the city right now where we're discussing this. By coincidence, we were at lunch, and we were having a discussion at the table, and someone who had been at the hearing yesterday at the city council said that the mayor had very uh, carefully presented himself in the council uh, uh, questioning, but the police force was not there and nor was the legal presentation of the mayor's office there. No, the, 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 the council to the direct mayor was there, but the, the council for the city was not there. I'm sure you're, probably, you're more aware of that than I, than I am. But again, the question is, have you had a chance to look at what's happening on our streets here in New York? Uh, do you see any relationship to Europe in that? Uh, and not be any, uh, and, and we discussed this at lunch, uh, it's probably coincidental that our mayor is Eastern European, and as we know, and I used to teach Jewish history, uh, we know that Hitler started with the Jews in, uh, in the streets of uh, Europe by making them wear the Star David and, and, and encountering them in the streets. How do you see Stop and Frisk in New York City, and how would you relate it as you relate it to your, your presentation? Uh, thank you. Unfortunately, we have only five minutes. I will say. Yeah, I will collect the question, and please be short and precise, and I will come to the... Somebody... What is it? Somebody was asking for. Okay. Yeah. My name is Ted Dad. I'm from the Peace Museum in New York. And piggybacking on that question, maybe it's a little bit more specific. Since you talked about shaping law enforcement, what might be doing on the Oh. What might. Ooh, that's really loud. Um, what might be, um, like I said, piggybacking on that gentleman's comments in terms of uh, the NYPD, if we are looking per, I think, your presentation to shape law enforcement and take responsibility in that, what might be the number one effort that we can make to do that, uh, specifically with NYPD, as opposed to North Carolina? to try out something. This is, after all, I think of this as an experimental conference, you know? It's not uh, hitting the established genealogies. And I want to use a term that for now I'm obsessing about. I admit it might be a temporary condition. But so, the notion of making presence. Now I, being absolutely not objective and projecting my obsessions on all three talks, <laughs> I heard the fact of making presence. Now in the case of of uh, Clementine, I think it's a very complicated story. Yeah. But ultimately, and what I know about the amazing work you're doing in the museum, you, you are sort of reinventing something about these objects, and in a way it is about making presents. And in Joanna, I, I just was astounded, I learned so much from your presentation. It's a weird kind of making presents. The super, what are they called, the wonderful? I have to go, yeah. yes. And, and, and uh, Sudhir, for you, what you are actually saying is that there is something that lacks presence in our common understanding of how a city can function, whether one agrees with that, Pache, the comment before, or not a separate matter. And, and what you are calling for, in a way, is 
for something to become more present, in other words, making presence, that has to do with some version of policing that, if I got you right, has to do with protecting public space, not persecuting or incarcerating. Uh, so I just, you know. Is that okay? Can I, I'd like to respond because I was trying to work out as well, I mean, policing objects is clear. We're, we're dealing with that every day. Um, uh, but one of the things that interests me in, in this making presence question and the flow from the, from the dense working class neighborhoods, so-called, to the cultural institutions, is this idea of being under the radar. And, you know, all the time I think about um, the underground. What is the underground today? You know, and you see the 1940s re resistance, and you have to think of warfare and how it affects metaphors of, of resistance and subcultural activity and whatever. And I haven't seen Mamadou for 16 years, and we were talking about people who were involved in resistance in aesthetic areas in Dakar, in Senegal. And I remember at the time that I understood what they were doing as communicational abstinence. In other words, a conscious decision not to respond, not to dialogue with people who turned up from the inside or the outside of Africa and who said, ah, I'm here now, show me your work. And they would say, yeah, but it's not, a good, it's not good for me now. But it wasn't, um, they, they weren't being uh, lazy, they were consciously resisting communication. So that's one thing. Then I think you have, um, I'm trying constantly to work out what's going on in the way we're speaking about all of this. You know, uh, you have a kind of um, sociology, philosophical discourse that is suddenly now architecture. Architecture is sociological discourse. Or you might have a, around, or the other way around, but you okay. have a lot of that at the moment. Like you have a lot of artists now who are not producing things and materiality, but are, are, are talking a lot. Just as you also have a kind of situation where a social worker can be an artist, and I think that one of the most, for me, crucial artworks that has happened in the last 10 years has been Thomas Hirschhorn's Musée Précaire, which happened in Aubervilliers, where the riots subsequently mm -hmm. took part, place, but had nothing to do with it. And just for those who may not know about it, Thomas Hirschhorn, an exiled Swiss artist li living in Paris, had a studio in Aubervilliers, or still has it, and became friendly with a, um, um, a tenement house um, with a lot of Malian and Senegalese um, inhabitants and decided to see if he could build one of his famous shacks, like he did the Bataille Monument mm. Documenta, but even more extreme this time, a shack that would be on a park outside this, on, on a, in a public park, um, made out of his usual cardboard construction, but within it, a container. And he then negotiated, and you can read the whole dialogue, with the Centre Georges Pompidou, with the Museum of Contemporary Art in Paris, to loan a Picabia, a Man Ray, a Duchamp, uh, I don't know if they had a Picasso, but you know, whatever, that's been done now uh, in Ramallah, but they, they brought every week a new piece uh, and they, the, the inhabitants of the museum worked with him and for three months they had the Musée Précaire. In other words, they dealt with the idea of a precarious institution. And he, it's, I think it's a one-time situation because he, they actually took the works and had them in there, housed in there, um, incarcerated in another way for one week at a time, and they got all the high-level, high-faluting French academics to come and give talks. You know, similarly with the 24-hour Foucault project, within 24 hours you could photocopy and listen to everything that Michel Foucault had produced or had been produced around him. And I think that these are very important moments where, of course, Hirschhorn would never claim to be a pedagogue yeah, or an educationalist. But I wonder sometimes what we're, when, when we're trying to find what is going on under the radar and how it infiltrates the center, then we have to also think about the way that we're mixing certain languages up at the moment. You know, uh, the sociological, the architectural, all these things, and, and that diffusion of disciplinary boundaries is important, and we have to keep that reflection going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, I found your talk fascinating, um, well, both your talks. Um, with, with you, I mean, you know, the, the ways in which you kind of open up the idea of the museum and... Um, 
the way that you open up the idea of the museum, I found that so rich and so evocative as an architect. Uh, the museum as motorway and um, what were some of the other ones? The, the domestic, you know, the idea of a domestic space at the same time this uh, urban space. Um, and for me, um, you know, also your terminology, uh, logos to ethnos, that's really provocative for me because in Greece, I mean, ethnos, ethnography is not used um, as a discipline, as the, the way to talk about um, anthropology because it means nation. nation. So it's, it's fun. I mean, there's a lot of really interesting and uh, um, complex and dense conversations um, I think one could have. But um, for me, the, um, one of the things that I think is really, really interesting about design is that it's about engaging with the other. And I think that that's also, um, you know, the idea of, of, of making. Um, and so, I don't know, somehow I think we could um, make interesting connections. But and I think, <laughs> yeah, and I think it's related to really with, with a question of, of, of presence. But, but we have, I, I guess, at least in uh, colonial and post-colonial context, to, 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 to qualify such a presence. Is it an expected? What is expected mm -hmm. when you are present there? And, and the other thing is the suspected presence, which is what, what Sudir was dealing with. And this tension is an important tension in, in the ways in which people are redefining and reconfiguring, which is the discussion of this morning, the public space. Sudhi. There was a wonderful um, normative quality that come, came out in the deeply reflective presentation that you gave, Clementine, and I, and I think it was, it's something that is difficult to, to incorporate in settings like this, but the kind of reflection that you're doing at the museum in terms of your relationship to these objects and the choices that you make, I think is, is really quite encouraging and uplifting, inspiring. Um, and you juxtapose that to the kind of transformation that we see in your slides um, the tr and the revalorization of objects. Um, it makes me think of that one way to approach the, the question about stop and frisk is an idea of, 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 uh, of ownership. Um, when I visit with police officers, I routinely see a kind of mimicry of stop and frisk that happens in highly segregated communities that, um, that occurs in, in Italian American communities and, and Irish communities and so on. Of course it's not stop and frisk, I understand that. I, and I, I don't mean to um, denigrate the kind of abuse that happens to, uh, to minorities in the, in the city. I think it's, a, it's an awful policy. But it is a policy that is nevertheless um, spread out uh, in many different kinds of communities. And the disproportionate utilization in one area is one aspect we should be turning to, particularly the legal community, so that we can end it. There is another, however, that gets uh, far less attention, which is that, and here this bro idea of broker or the middleman is key, because in any community, in any corner of Harlem, you will see a kind of stopping, not frisking, but stopping, questioning, locating, understanding on the south side of Chicago and Atlanta, wherever it happens to be, um, a relationship to young men, to young women, uh, across generations, um, a specification, an interrogation of who is there, why are you here, etc., in which the community owns the right to be able to question people that are moving through its space. So it's not stop and frisk necessarily, but it's a mediated form of understanding who strangers are in one's midst, making sense of them, and moving forward. Um, this is done uh, constantly, and it raises for me this idea of brokerage, because uh, what, if many communities are doing this in practice, or in, in a, in a, in a, at a surface level, then the idea of, of, of the future has to come into play, which is stop and frisk has a particular end that is devastating, which is this, it has absolutely no, uh, it, it has no purpose other than to signal to that young man or young woman that you have no future with respect, with respect to this particular institution. This institution will not serve you. You, have, you will be accosted, you will be uh, brought to public light, and you will be told in a, in a way to act. And that their future is bracketed. They can't imagine any other relationship to the person stopping and frisking them 
other than that they are a threat. Changing that future and changing that narrative so that the very same practice is part of a, a, a dialogue and a part of a, a, of a milieu of public safety is a very different kind of way of self-governance or a very different form in which that same institutional event can signal something different to that young man or young woman in question. So I think, I, I, I think it's abhorrent, the practice, but I think if we don't see that that's an essential informal aspect of what happens on the street, we will fail to understand why the same thing occurs in Canarsie, in Whitestone, Queens, in East New York, as well as Harlem, and why it is, has a different end in sight. Thank you. I would like to thank the presenter and the audience. And I have an announcement to make. The next panel is going to proceed right away, and because we are not going to have a, a break. So, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.